So welcome everyone. So I'm Joel Matthews and I'm the neuropharmacist at Bart's Health. Hi, I'm Rachel Dorsey Campbell and I'm the neuropharmacist at Imperial. Right, so the session for the work. So we've got some questions that have been submitted previously um, via email and to the Academy and via Twitter and all sorts. So we're going to go through some of those. Uh, Rachel, one of the qu uh, questions we had coming through is as we reflect on all of this COVID-19 and the acute pandemic since April, what have you observed and experienced and what would you highlight as make you most proud of the neuropharmacist response to this? So I think what we've all observed is that, um, is that things have changed quite quickly and we've all had to adapt and be quite flexible in the way that we do things. Um, and I think pharmacists have been particularly good at that in terms of the network that we already have um, around the country. We're quite good at communicating with our colleagues to find out what they're up to, to find out what the what other people are doing. So exchange of information is something that I think neuropharmacists have been really good at um, and keeping on top of um, guidance as it comes out. And in terms of guidance, I know Deborah, who works at um, King's, one of the pharmacists that's part of our London network, um, drew up monitoring guidelines. And I think that was one of the first questions that was asked of pharmacists early on was, what do we do about blood test monitoring? So it was quite nice that um, one of our group was able to draw together a consensus for London in terms of what was what we thought was reasonable monitoring. Um, and then we went on then to raise that with the ABN because they were updating their guidelines. So we had the opportunity to say to the ABN, you know, it would be a good idea to put some monitoring guidance in your guideline. And, and so to get our, um, our monitoring guidelines um, considered and included in the ABN guidelines, I think was, was, um, was quite a good achievement for pharmacists yeah. at this time. <laughs> yeah. And it's an unusual time because pharmacists are very used to evidence-based medicine and obviously there's no evidence for anything to do with COVID and never mind all the evidence we did have, it sort of goes out the window because it's not yeah. to COVID time and it's quite a strange time. And I think that's, um, that's where, where um, staff often do turn to pharmacists in to look for guidance, especially in times when there isn't guidance. So, uh, so yeah, so I think we've been quickly had to sort of think about how we were updating our staff in terms of um, the guidance that was out there um, and also dealing with the sort of practical problems that, that the, the, the virus has presented with infusion units and things. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess so I think, go on, you go. most pharmacists have been, a lot of them have been redeployed. So the network has enabled the sharing of knowledge. So it didn't really matter where the query was coming from. We all worked as a group to help each other out. Yeah, so yeah. while you're working on ITU or wherever you've been redeployed to, you're actually able to find out answers or someone was able to help. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that's, that's something that we need to make sure we keep going in the new normal is yeah. that we're good at disseminating information and, and um, communicating changes to guidance to the, to the nursing and con consultant staff as well as within ourselves, because I think yeah. that's really important. Yeah. And then I think the webinars and everything else, the guidance has come out so quickly. So there's a rough, approximately 750 papers come out on COVID every single day. That many? There no, wow. There's no way anyone could read all of those. No. Um, but actually, just if people just share what we need to learn and the practical bits, but also understanding something that was written in April is yeah. now out of date. Absolutely. So yeah. Actually, you know, we're used to these massive trials and stuff and that what stands stands. It's very different now. And I think that's a really hard thing for patients to understand and that we, we we went out in the beginning with the guidance from the ABN that we should, you know, stop treat well, there wasn't any guidance. So in the absence of guidance, we all kind of stopped treating patients for a little while while we worked out what the risks were. And as the guidance came in, it it, it sort of changed and then it came out another version came out and it changed again. So messages to patients at the beginning were we're not going to give you these drugs they're too dangerous and now we're saying yeah come in have the drug it's fine yeah. and you can understand why that's really confusing for patients so i think it's really important that nationally we all try and stick to the same kind of approach to these things which is why it was great to get some abn guidance and the last version intentionally um, has a date sort of further away in the future and is not so committed so, so that it allows some changes to happen over the next um, the next few months as the level of risk changes. Yeah, and also I think as a country, the level of the risk might be individual. You have to individualise it. Yeah. So, you know, although the country level risk currently is for going down to three, it might be a particular individual might have a higher risk factor because yeah. of just what's going on in their local area and in their home life and work life. Exactly, yeah. 
Sorry. Just looking at the other questions then, Jola, um, there were some other questions that have come in. Um, we talked about infusion capacity briefly there. Um, one of them was um, infusion capacity is a problem in many centres. How are you prioritising patients to be treated and what role can pharmacy play in this? So for even prior to COVID, most centres were running close to maximum infusion capacity. So no one had lots of spare capacity even prior to COVID-19. Um, so obviously the MDT helps um, broach like who is eligible, who can get infusion-based therapies. But we've explored other infusion options. So as a centre, we're exploring, I'm calling it a hospital at home to do differentiate it from home care, which people just assume is a delivery service. So hospital at home is a nurse will come to the patient's home and do infusions there. But this isn't applicable for all centres, so it's very few centres that we have to work for due to other constraints. But also it's like we've increased the um, interval between for certain infusions, but then it's working to prioritise the patient. So it's, you don't want anyone to go without treatment but also to make sure it's equitable across your service for all patients. So for big centres where you have patients travelling a long way and things, you need to make sure that it's all equitable and it's not just the local population that are served. The issue is some of the progressive patients who may be shielding for other reasons, for other comorbidities, might not want to come into the centre for the infusions and not forgetting that we have, we have a, a role to play for their treatment as well. It's hard because there is a risk of COVID but they, all these patients have been diagnosed with MS. So there isn't, you know, so we do need to treat their MS and not forget to do that. Yeah, so I know there's been a lot of in, in, interest in your um, um, potential hospital at home um, treatment. So could you just, for those people that don't know, just explain what drugs you're looking at and, and how, it, how it's likely to work? So the hospital at home is for the infusion-based therapies, so natalizumab and ocrelizumab, and it would work, the patients would get the initial doses, so for um, ocrelizumab, the um, week one, week um, 15 doses, and for natalizumab, at least two to three months of doses within the hospital to check the patient's not going to su uh, suffer any severe infusion-based reactions and, that, and can tolerate the drug. The patient can then move to hospital at home where it, a nurse comes to the patient's home to infuse the patient. The delivery of the drug, the removal of the sharps and everything happens on the same day, so there isn't multiple... Um, times so that the patient has to be in the home which has come up before when we've looked at um, hospital at home services so is, the it the infusion, is it the infusion nurse is not bringing the drug though that there's a delivery and then a visit and they, um, they hope they could be either or so it depends how it's going to work so obviously the nurse is going to go to two to three homes they might have the delivery to the patient's home so it's a case of it'll be different on a day by day basis right but it's um it's an interesting option it, it solves a lot of the travel issues like we both work in central london hospitals driving to our infusion center is not an option um because there's no parking and um, so your people are having to get public transport so therefore and that is one of the riskiest things you could do in london i know from next week you have to wear a face covering but that can be that can cause quite a lot of anxiety for patients they're also coming alone. So a lot of patients will have their infusion. They're used to their husband, wife, friend coming along with them to keep them coming through the infusion, or you know, just make sure, like, just make sure they're okay. But because hospital rules are changing, everyone's coming without a visitor. That sort of increases the anxiety, and you can't even say to the the friend, "Oh, you can go sit at the coffee shop because that's closed." Yeah, so, no, that does cause a lot of anxiety, not being able to have someone with them, doesn't it? Yeah, so and even for the journey, so even if someone came with them for the journey, they would literally have to walk the streets of Whitechapel while mm. they, which isn't great. So. so, I mean, obviously it sounds great, but I mean, have you, so you, have you got um, commissioning agreement then to do this? Have you, have you so, involved commissioners in that? So we spoke to the commissioners and because for those of you who don't know, in England, we've all, all the trusts have moved to block contracts. So they took our, your month nine spend on for all of your different services. So not just neurology, but across hematology and cancer and everyone else. And that's what they've used to work out the costs that you were getting back for this COVID period of time. So the commissioners have said, because of that block contract, that should cover the nursing cost. Um, we, and which it 
kind of does because of the because the medication will be delivered at home you're not paying VAT on it so I mean that yeah off, so that offsets sets the cost of the nursing cost so it, it's not going to cost the trust money and, and just to clarify you're not doing this for all your patients what sort of numbers are you talking about so a handful of patients to start with and it might grow I think every service needs to offer multiple options because it's not going to be one service suits all because no, no. patients might not live somewhere that's suitable to have a home infusion like um, or want to oh yeah. yeah some people might prefer to come in you know yeah, yeah for the yeah, same yeah. reasons that some people don't yeah yeah so it's keeping the it's keeping all options open um and i think it's just one way so the other way that obviously would help with the infusion capacity is the shorter infusion um, times yeah so that's come at a really good time hasn't it yeah so that's been perfect timing it's so oculizumab from dose three if you're counting the week one and week 15 so from that point onwards can be a shorter infusion time which is great news because it means in theory you can fit another patient on that chair in the time and it's managing that capacity really well and working with everyone to making sure that you have the capacity yeah. so the we schedule make sure we is have, really key isn't it yeah and also we make sure we have enough vials in pharmacy so if if a patient rings up today and says oh i've got symptoms or whatever we have enough vials that we can book another patient in and things like yep. that it is important to screen all the patients coming through the service to make sure you're not putting other patients at risk so, yeah definitely and that's been really important so obviously all of this takes up more time the screening of patients making sure everyone's safe including the staff so you're not testing patients though are you you're no. doing the covid serum test on them no. no i don't think many people are are they at the moment it's a symptom screen that you're talking no. about yeah yeah so you talk so we will, we will get tests that are quicker it's just if you are going to use them more for all your patients yeah and then it's the 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 how useful that is in terms of that they're only negative or positive on the day that you've tested them yeah and you know and and you know they, that might change yeah so it's it's a fluid thing isn't it so you mentioned there about um extended interval dosing as a way of improving capacity so we, we can extend these interval between our oculizumab doses but also natalizumab one of the actual questions was um that came to us was um, how and when should we revert back to four weekly infusions? So this is, I presume, somebody who's was always doing four weekly infusions and then has moved to six or eight weekly infusions during the time of the pandemic and is now talking about when they should go back to four yeah. weekly dosing. So what's your thoughts on that? So it will depend on that the unit's capacity and also when patients um, are, are happy to come back to every four weekly because it's a bit of a change. You've told patients... Oh, we moved you to six weekly, which is, you know, for infusion capacity, but also they have less trips to the hospital. So they've got their head around that. Now you're saying you might go to four weekly. So it will be conversations with everybody. Um, a reminder that the licensed dose is four weekly. Um, and so anything outside that is off license. So that should be documented in the patient's medical notes as well. Um, although there is evidence for the six weeks interesting weekly. question joe i've never thought about before because you tick a box on the blue tech form that says you're using the drug at the licensed dose don't you yeah yeah, yeah so it's never occurred to me before <laughs> yeah so you know, like so you, you should document in the notes that yeah we are doing these things off license like off yeah. license um and but there is lots of evidence and there's posters that have been published for the six weekly dose so just making sure but it might be that you prioritize certain patients to go back to four weekly so we, for the majority of our new starters, we've left them at four weekly. And then because most of the evidence for the extended doses is if they're more stable on the treatment. So actually making sure that um, you're prioritizing which patients should go back to four weekly and which might stay at the extended dose because you want to keep some of that capacity going. So yeah. if you move yeah. everyone back from six uh, weekly, eight weekly to four weekly, um, that's an issue. So our capacity in our old neuro unit is 50% of what it used to be. We're currently, we've moved and we're squatting somewhere else, but the owners of that um, unit want to come back. So we're going to have to <laughs> return to our neuro day case, but that's at 50% capacity without, because of social distancing. Yeah. That has a massive Everyone's impact. got a redu reduction in the number of couches and things that they can use because yeah. of that, they? yeah. Which if you're already a very small unit with a yeah. small room that only does three or four people, you're you know that's a, quite a big change isn't it we've gone from 12 couches to 10 so our yeah. our, our uh, reduction capacity is, is small compared to someone that's gone from four to two which is a 50 percent reduction yeah. isn't it yeah 
and it's, it's that and but also it's the anxiety of patients so i mean in life no one is standing next to anybody that they don't live with you know, like you're not yeah. meant to so and then all of a sudden we're saying can you sit next to this random stranger <laughs> so for ages so you know you do have to manage people's anxiety and i think the anxiety amongst the ms community is quite high because it's a in April and in March, we were telling them, oh, you're immunosuppressed, you know, you're quite likely, yeah. you know, to catch this. We, you know, you might need to shield. So there were patients put on the shielding list. And then all of a sudden to say, oh, no, we now think you're going to be fine. And the evidence is that they're not more likely to catch yeah. COVID immunosuppression. But we, we do have to manage the anxiety. And it might not be the patient. It might be their loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. I'm finding that with I'm doing some of the phone calls um, to helping um, do the phone calls to the patients, inviting them back, and um, or scheduling first doses now of ocrelizumab. We'll come to. There are some questions we were sent before about when to restart treatment, so we'll come back to that. But yeah, um, yeah and they are so hugely grateful to have a proper one-on-one -on -one conversation like that about what the risks are in reality to them. And so I think that is really important. And actually, something pharmacists could get more involved in is having those conversations with patients about risk. But just to come back briefly to the natalizumab scheduling thing, Joe, you you talk about putting them back to four weekly, but there's there's an argument for not for the patients that have been on it longer than yeah. two years to, to not do that. And there are some centres around the country who not, routinely go to six weekly dosing after two years of treatment. Ours don't, and yours don't for everyone, do they? No, and but then this needs to be a conscious decision. If you are deciding that's what you're going to do, you need to decide as a unit that's what you're going to do, rather than be like, oh, we've left them by mistake. And that, yeah, that's what, and, and recognize it's off license and collect it, details. And also, like just looking at basic pharmacokinetics, there might be a weight limit where actually, if you're above a certain weight, we really need to reduce, come, make you back down to four weekly. I have no idea what that weight should be. So, so, but there might be a point of that's how you risk that. No, there is, that comes from some data, doesn't it? That the that yeah. patients of a, a certain BMI didn't do so well on the increased interval. Yeah, um, yeah. So we need to. That's something for the future. Is dose based natalizumab, weight based natalizumab dosing. Yeah. yeah, and it's the interval that we could, are looking at. So it's just yeah. and it's making that decision as a centre. That's what you want to do. So it's sort of a decision on like for your population at MDT level that this is what you're going to do for your population and then base it on patient criteria as well. So, And I think the other challenge for units in terms of scheduling natalizumab other than four weekly is the actual scheduling. Yeah. A four weekly schedule on a calendar is quite a neat and easy thing to do on a recurring basis. Yeah. Um, it becomes trickier when it's six weekly, but I think we need to stop using that as a reason for yeah. dosing four weekly in some of our longer term patients and actually yeah. find solutions to the scheduling. Yeah, and I think, I mean, and it's going to be more important when we when more units are reaching capacity. And you do have to remember that if you're doing anything outside the four weekly, it's off license. So you do, yeah, yeah the blue yeah. check, you've ticked it to say you're using it in license, so. That's a good point, yeah, I mean, to add it to our, to our notes, which I'm not sure we do actually, now you've said that. So we haven't had any more questions come in live yet. So if any of you do have any, any burning questions for us, please pop in the Q&A box on the bottom. Um, but we've, had, we've still got some that came in in advance that we can continue to work through, I think, didn't we, Joe? Yeah, so um, we've got one. We mentioned ocrelizumab infusions. So um, is it okay to resume the uh, ocrelizumab infusions for existing patients? Are there any additional checks that you would check Presuming you've checked that their COVID don't have any uh, negative and don't have any symptoms, and when would you start new patients? Okay, so the ABN guidance um, says that we should. Um, it's reasonable to restart ocrelizumab at a high and very high. So three is that three and four, four and five. I forget the numbering, but anyway, at a high at a high risk COVID scenario, which is what we're in at the moment. The ABN guidance is that it's reasonably safe to start and redose people on oculismab. And we actually went ahead of that guidance and started doing that, I think the week before it came out. Um, so we've um, delayed some repeat dosing and starting, but now offered it to everybody who was, who was waiting, although there is a backlog because, we've, because of the reasons we've talked about already with infusion capacity. Um, 
the, so in terms of additional precautions, we're obviously, like we've just mentioned, having those conversations with patients about what their actual risk is, both what the national risk is, what yeah. the ABN's view of the risk is, but as you've said, what their personal risk is. Um, and that can be quite reassuring to people, yeah. allowing them to say no, if that's their choice, yeah. obviously, that they don't want to come in is fine. So to, discussing risk with them essentially reconsenting them because um, if they've been consented already they now need a reconsent in terms of covid and the risk of covid to them um, and the additional question i'm including in my consent um, reconsent conversations is about vaccination and i think we can come we were going to come back to sort of vaccination more broadly um, and covid vaccination but we need to make them aware that they'll have a reduced response to any future covid vaccine and then armed with all that information then they can decide whether they're coming in and then on our unit, I think the same as yours, they're just doing a symptom screen at the door. So the, the, the unit's closed um, to sort of people wandering in and out, obviously. And then there, there's a socially distanced queue outside and uh, they're brought in one at a time. No relatives or, or uh, friends uh, had a symptom screen, temperature check in a side room and then moved to a distance infusion couch um, for their infusion. And um, with a shorter infusion time, then um, hopefully out of an hour or two quicker than they would have been otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, are you doing the shorter infusions for oculizumab from um, cycle three onwards? Yeah. So day one and day 15 with normal, yeah. normal um, um, infusion. And then any, any returners after that who did not have. So I've just realized that's the quote. There's a live question on that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, question is how are you identifying those patients suitable for faster oculizumab rates and are you implementing so you've just asked me that <laughs> yeah so yeah um so we're identifying that so the guidelines are that the spc for that yeah. is um only patients who had um no none or mild reactions in their first two or previous doses so that involves not stopping the infusion at all, or even if they just had a slowdown and a restart of their slowdown of the infusion rate, they can still go on to a faster infusion rate second time. It's only those people that had an interrupted infusion or a stopped infusion previously due to reactions that can't have a faster infusion rate this time round. Yeah. And the, the evidence was they trialed it and there was not a significant difference in adverse drug reactions, infusion rate reactions between the two the two rates yeah um, which is why we're able to do that now and i guess we haven't had m that many patients that have been at the faster infusion rates no we only started that this week so derek's asking how are we finding it uh too soon to say <laughs> yeah but i think it is important that everyone collects data on this i know it's just another thing we need to collect data on but actually you know how many patients are getting the infusion rates if there has been a delay in their cycle three dose are you I, like we don't know the answers to some yeah. of these questions, so it's it would be useful if we knew that the answers to some of these and have to try and collect it. Yeah, and I think what, what this is something else where pharmacists can really be helpful is that um, there's a lot of data that nurses and pharmacists collect every day without even realising they're doing it. Um, and if we just did it in a more um, in a cleverer way, where we had we were able to access it you know, retrospectively, um, we'd have loads of data. For those of us using electronic administ drug administration prescribing systems, um, you can pull off reports from, so we use Cerner and, and I've asked Cerner to pull off a report on blood pressure monitoring of all of our Ocaluzumab patients during their attendances. So we then, you've then got real world data on what actually is happening to your patient's blood pressure. Um, and similarly, if you were to go back and look at um, there was a poster at the EAN that we recently um, had had a, a virtual attendance to from Brighton where they looked, they'd just done exactly that, documented adverse reactions to ocrelizumab and just collected the data to see if their patients were having the same sorts of reactions as, as the trials suggested, which they were. There were 80% of them were having none or mild reactions. So yeah, there's lots of data like that, real world data that we could collect. And coming back to the network theme, if we collect it in wider groups, then the data is more powerful. Yeah, and I think it is important that we just sort of do collect the data and maybe we should actually, after this, come up with some sort of data collection tool sheet that everyone's collecting then the same data. Because yeah, yeah. And my, my hypothesis is if you, have, if you are prone to infusion rate re, um, related reactions, are you more likely to get them if your infusion date was delayed because of COVID? Like, you oh, know, that's an interesting uh, question. 
I have no idea of the answer and I have no idea, but I just, I just wondered. And I was thinking, we can answer that from what we do in our centres and maybe that is something we should be looking at. Yeah. So anyone who's listening who's going to the MS Trust Conference, which has um, been delayed like every conference, um, you know, there's an opportunity to do some posters and stuff, I think, relating yeah. to all of this kind of these kind of questions. Definitely. They're quite easy ones to do as well. Cause, and it, but it's the things we're collecting already. But it's just, yeah. make, you know, and I said, well, we, if everyone collected their next five patients, so you're not collecting, but if everyone, every centre did yeah. it, it's quite yeah. a lot of data we get. So the other question about um, ocrelizumab, Jola, was in relation to um, the new, uh, the newer license of PPMS. Yeah. Um, so the question was, um, do you think COVID-19 has had an impact? Presumably on, on the numbers that we've started, which um, in our centre, we weren't starting many anyway. But what, what yeah. do you think about that? I think yes, because the patients, because we had stopped, treat we'd stopped treatment for, say, you've lost two months, then getting the patients back in. And also the PPMS patients are more likely to be the patients that would struggle to come in in London or using public transport. So therefore, just on personal reasons, they might struggle to get in and therefore we're delaying their treatment. But they're the patients you kind of, they've waited for ages for this treatment and now we're delaying it again. So then the patients that we felt that would benefit from the hospital at home um, treatments as well, which is... Yeah. So it, yeah. So it's it's a different cohort, but it's not forgetting that they're there. There also then is the issue of obviously appointments have stopped, or face to face appointments with neurologists have stopped. So new diagnosis, MRIs have been delayed, and all of these other things which will stop treatment escalations or treatment starting. It's not just once a patient's identified. Yeah. So have you treated many um, PPMS patients? Yeah, we yeah we've treated a we've treated a handful. Yeah, a handful. Yeah, that's why I, I was just getting a feeling for whether because I think we've only done one or two. I think from memory, yeah, it's, not, it's not it's not big numbers, um, but it's yeah, we still yeah. we still don't want them to be forgotten in the mix. No, and similarly, um, as we come on to other progressive treatments, it's um, it's identifying them in the first place actually is is um, tricky for our services yeah. and progressive patients who aren't haven't had drugs available to them all this time, some of whom are lost to follow up. Um, and I think they're the patients that in this time can be stay lost because of everything else that's going on, because it's easier to not find them at the moment. Yeah. So, so someone asked, um, I'll be updating all of our DMT protocols in light of COVID-19 and, and the upcoming vaccines. So we have updated everything because you have to take into the fact that risk, we wanted to know what we were doing. And um, it was very easy for the platform therapies, it was as you were and carry on. Um, and it's more the higher risk therapies that have had changes made to them. Yeah, so the, so the, like you say, interferon, glutirima, teraflunamide and tecfidera, uh, diodimethofumarate, um, the guidance is that, that they are safe to continue or start now yeah. um, and um, so we, we've continued to do that the challenge being for us in that we don't deliver everything by home care so actually um, adjusting our um, processes for delivering to patients so they don't have to come to hospital has been a massive impact on our service for those of you with on-site community pharmacies dealing with the workload um, yeah. it's something we didn't predict when we opted out of home care was that we wouldn't be able to have people come into the hospital to collect their drugs. Um, but we're dealing with that. But yeah, and then, um, so fingolimod and ocrelizumab then, as per the ABN guidance, is um, safe, reasonably safe, but on a more cautious base, case by case basis. I think everyone's in agreement yeah. with that. Um, and then alamtuzumab and cladribine are the riskier ones that we need to be thinking about delaying people still while we're still at a high risk or having been healed after after doses and it's yeah. warranting that now remembering if you are asking someone to shield if you want them to get the government support for shielding so the food boxes and the mental health support and everything else you need to register them as shielding on the government dot um, website yeah. so it, it's not a case of just tell the patient to hang out at home for two weeks or like six months it's a case of actually register them so they get that support yeah and if you do that it does come up on their scr record so if a gp is looking up so everyone that is then aware of what's going on yeah 
Because I think we, we mentioned this earlier, didn't we? There were a lot of mixed messages regarding the risks for patients early on. And a lot of our patients got those texts and phone calls to say they should be shielding when yeah. given the, the, the risks we've just described as per the ABN. It's actually only the alentuzumab and cladribine patients that really need, and, and those who've had it in the last three months, that need yeah. to be completely shielding for 12 weeks. And everybody else is not actually... Um, yeah. based on that risk alone is not required to shield I, I, if they have other like you said additional risk factors of their own if they've got other comorbidities that's different but based on having ms and being on those drugs that's not a reason to shield yeah. and that has been a difficult conversation for some of our staff and myself to have with patients who have been told to shield and then we're telling them actually no we don't believe that's the correct advice anymore we all thought that at the beginning maybe yeah. <laughs> but that's changed now yeah and also as a country, I don't think COVID has hit the high numbers all at once that we often thought. It wasn't, you know, as horrific as we thought. So it wasn't that everybody walking outside was catching COVID. And that was a fear to start with. So it is, as a country, we've done well. Like we didn't have to use the Nightingale as, to full capacity, you know, so yeah. or because of the actions of us as a society. So... Yeah, and I think it's sensible for people to continue to, to you know, stick to the strict social distancing, you know, rules, um, um, as especially those people on MS treatments. But yeah. yeah, I think this anxiety about not being able to go out the house at all for 12 weeks, we can reassure some patients that that's, that's no longer the case. And actually what's really important is for mental health reasons is for people to be able to get outside if they can um, yeah. and get some air and some exercise. Yeah. So we just mentioned alemtuzumab there and the fact that people do need to shield with alemtuzumab. I think we had a question specifically about alemtuzumab, yeah. didn't we? Yeah, we did. Is somebody had asked, um, I'm just reading their quote directly, is one of my patients had their first course in March 2019, so last March. They were due their second in March 2020, it was delayed due to COVID-19. Their white cell count is around three, lymphocyte 0.7, so not completely reconstituted. Um, Amy provided August 2020, and the current white cell count is 2.3, so it has increased. It's then the lymphocyte 0.8, so it's roughly the same as it was in March. Should they wait for the pandemic threat level to drop to below two, which is decided on an England-wide basis, mm. and um, or should they schedule the second course with a maximum delay of six months with post-infusion before? precautions of self-isolation at 12 weeks yeah so that's so did you say march they had their first so yeah so they're three months delayed at the moment yeah so so yeah so the abn guidance on alentuzumab is that it's that the, the whilst we're at a high risk there needs to be caution about using redosing alentuzumab and that the advice is you can push the second dose out to, to 18 months after the first so they've still got three months before they actually um, reach that 18 months so I if it was our patient I would certainly be suggesting they wait three months if not just to see what the risk level is doing over the next three months um, um, and then the lymphocyte count we don't redose people if their lymphocytes are less than 0.8 so if they're 0.8 or above yeah she's 0.8 now years so. now then then we would we would go ahead with that lymphocyte okay. count um, but certainly I wouldn't be I would be asking people to wait at least for the to the to the eighteen month mark, and then they would still need to, they would be the group then that needed to do the full twelve week shielding after they had that dose. And I think in terms of the um, the England risk assessment sort of being level two, level three, you need to look at that patient's individual risk factors and what's going on in their home life. If they're living with a load of people that are going out to high risk areas working on COVID wards, you might think, oh, hang on a second, we might want to delay a bit more. If they're living alone and able to self socially isolate a lot easier, then, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're shielding, if you're living with people that are going out, it's still very different risk factors. So you do need to individualise it, which does make it hard, but it's yeah. take their risk factor. And also discuss it with the patient. How much risk are they willing to take? They might be fearing the MS relapses more than they're fearing COVID. Yeah, so we haven't mentioned that up till now, have we? Actually, the fear of yeah, the fear of what will happen to your MS control versus the fear of getting an infection. And at the beginning, that was shifted one yeah. way. We were all more worried about them getting COVID than we were about their MS. But as time goes on, I do think that's gone back the other way now because of the delays think, to treatment. And I think it depends on the patient. And I think yeah. like you do. That's why you need these conversations with patients because 
it's so difficult otherwise and actually then it does make them feel like they're being treated as an individual and we taking it into account which is also quite important yeah but that's a huge workload impact isn't it because a lot of those conversations have already been had yeah. like before covid you know patients thought they knew what the consultant and nurses and um, pharmacists where there are them in clinic have talked to the patients about their risks that was understood probably consented to a risk at a time and then that risk has now changed which means patients we wouldn't normally be talking to before their infusion we're now having to get back in contact with and, yeah. and have conversations with so that is a massive workload and what i've said to our teams are we must make sure that all of these phone calls are documented uh, not just in the notes but as an encounter with the patient as a clinic yeah. conversation as activity in clinics because a lot of there was a lot of goodwill phone calls going on with patients yeah. Um, and there needs to be some capture of that as a workload um, because yeah. it's not sustainable. And also, so, and therefore, it needs to be someone that understands the risk level if needed if patients want to speak to people, like making sure that it's not just the person that schedules your appointments, it's having a conversation with someone that can discuss if there are questions or queries coming up. Yeah. And you know what we did actually, because we had staff redeployed to us to help with some initial workload around patients so as i mentioned we didn't we don't use home care for fingolimod and tech for dira um and so we were having to phone all of those patients to say don't come to hospital we'll we'll send okay. you your drugs and you can skip a blood test if that was appropriate which it was for most people um but yeah so we had people redeployed to us who weren't part of our ms service and who weren't pharmacy staff um so we actually had to do a, a quick kind of this is the abn guidance and print off yeah. the version for patients yeah um and just say look if you're asked a question just read this to them because this is the the guidance um, but obviously at that time that's there were still a lot of questions about what that yeah. meant for them but at least it gave and i think that's something you can develop as you could actually write a script almost not a script but a guided yeah script for, pay, for people in your service of people so that the message is really consistent because that's really important it's when people get different messages from different people that they get quite anxious about things and that is a role for all of us healthcare professionals you do have to keep on top of all of the current guidance you can't say oh i read the abn guidance in april i'm fine you no keep on top of it which is as frustrating as it is because it means all of your cpd this year is on covid and ms risk and things but it means but it is, it is important for the treating of patients absolutely and, and the patient uh, charity groups and all of their um, websites have all got guidance so you can sign posts to them as well that was what i was going to say as well and at the bottom of that what we said to everybody is if you have any questions my personal favorite is the ms society um web, web page on ms and covid risk because they've pulled together all of the national guidance in different hyperlinks on one page and yeah. they've updated it as and when it's been updated and i think coming back to uh, what the role of the pharmacist is during this i think that's been something that's been really key i think is really important for pharmacists um, in my view our main role in the ms team is around safety yeah and being the quality you know the, the um the governance lead for the service and to make sure that all of those things somebody's got a sight of all that so uh, one of like as well as sort of trying to be involved in that guidance is then making sure it's adequately um communicated to everybody yeah. is really important um so yeah emailing or you know just messaging everyone signposting them to updated guidance um and um and making sure that they're able to implement it and understand it for patients and so and people know when they are updated because the abn version three i think we're on now um, it didn't get publicized very well did yeah it? people didn't know it'd been updated after the puff and then people were like what are you talking and so is if you do notice something is updated tell people because it might be that someone doesn't and I would, yeah and i would recommend to anyone listening who um who wants to keep on top of things twitter is the best place for yeah. all of this stuff <laughs> there might be a lot of rubbish on twitter but there's a lot of really interesting and educational updates that happen on twitter so if you follow the right people on twitter you'll be kept up to speed with all of these things and yeah as long as you're following the right people and the ukcp and euro group is we do tweet when things changes are happening so if you don't want to hear about pizza express and all the other things going on <laughs> in people's lives if you follow the official ones you will get some useful information yeah and I'll, you know obviously i will promote the bart's ms uh, the blog as well so they do that is a very useful one yeah yeah they have summarized a lot of the covid data out there as well so changing tack, so obviously Saponomod was due for its nice technology appraisal later this year and now the data has been extended to who knows when as NiceWorks stopped. 
do you know how many patients you're expecting to treat with saponamide and what are you worried about it? Um, so no, I don't, is the first, is the answer to your first question. I have no idea. Um, and so we're talking about secondary progressive patients, but the license is with activity. So they have to have had a scan or some um, okay. um, uh, active yeah. scan. So um, that I think is going to close the door on a lot of people with SPMS. So I think managing expectation is really important here. Um, and I think we've learned that lesson from probably the oculizumab PPMS, um, whether, you know, that was um, heralded as coming for, as a, as a treat, first treatment for people with PPMS, but then it, it wasn't for everybody because you had to have early disease with activity. And it's the same for the Siponimod group. My feeling is that a lot of our patients who would be eligible for Siponimod are probably already on a treatment because they've been diagnosed as RRMS but are coming out as, as uh, are now entering secondary progressive MS and probably yeah. need to have that reviewed um, but as a, f for a feel for numbers um, I, I, I don't know I yeah. really don't know and I think it's just gonna work I don't think there's a huge number of people with SPMS untreated or not on treatment waiting for this drug is my personal view I don't I don't see that being a big number of people and, and um, MRI capacity might influence oh gosh yeah so obviously most centers their MRI capacity has gone down by 50% because of the amount of cleaning that has to happen between patients. So, so we had something like, we had an email say something like 14,000 MRIs had been postponed or delayed or cancelled. And I think 4,000 of those were neurology ones at yeah. the trust. Uh, yeah. And so we're just, we're not getting our positive JCV Nitisabri yeah. patient scanned at the moment. So yeah, capacity for that is a big problem. And so I know that some trusts have talked about cancelling all scans booked and then having them rebooked so that people could risk stratify but if you went to any center and you said can you remember who you booked them for um it might that might is also are you just shifting the workload so yeah well our radiology team didn't go that far but they did send us a list of everyone we had booked an mri for and asked us to review them all on yeah. an individual basis yeah and obviously as pharmacists, we reviewed all the drug stuff, but actually we did, we probably as a uh, MS community, we weren't as good as reviewing the MRI capacity list, cause, you know, so, and because it wasn't something that entered people's heads to start with, so. Yeah, and I think, so yeah, so definitely MRI capacity in terms of diagnosing these patients, because they'll need an, a recent active scan yeah. for Siponimod. The other concern in, we've talked about uh, cancelling of clinics and stuff. So our, our trust has a target of only t going forward post pandemic of only having 10% of our consult consultations as face to face. They're looking at, a, I mean, oh, that's wow. probably going to relax to sort of uh, 80, 20%. Um, but essentially the huge majority of them, they want to remain virtual, um, which is fine for repeat reviews of yeah. DMT patients, I think, patients that are stable, but obviously all the new patients, and you can't diagnose someone with, MRS, uh, uh, with MS um, over the phone, and you can't tell them over the phone. Um, we should, even, that, should, that shouldn't be the way we do it anyway and even drug escalation sometimes yeah. you, you would have to say that would be easier face to face so you can get a scope of how people yeah. think so the so the thing with siponimod which is new which not everyone may be aware of is that you have to have a genetic screen before you start treatment yeah. um which in the form of a mouth swab um i believe um, so um, as part of the screening appointment where we would normally bring people in and have the conversation about risks and benefits and do blood tests we would also be required to do a mouth swab on the patient and the, the reason for that is if they have it's a it's a metabolized through the CYP enzyme um, pathway and if you have a, um, certain enzymes missing then you can't metabolize it and there's a small percentage of the population that have those enzymes missing so you get risk stratified either you can have it you or some people have to have a reduced dose or some people just can't have it at all because of their enzyme levels so that's a new workload for whoever's going to be there is an opportunity i think for pharmacy to get involved there you know i think i think nurses are uh, incredibly busy in their clinics and um, would probably value someone helping them set up that new service but that needs to be face to face you can't swab yeah. someone over the phone so um, whether we post out swab packs, I don't know. I, don't have, I have no idea if that's feasible to post them out and get the patients to do them themselves. But that needs to be thought into the yeah. processes. And then um, I think the, the question was also regarding whether we worried about interactions and things. And yeah. I think uh, the Sympodomod 
SPC to me reads very much like a Fringolum mod SPC. Yeah. I'm not sure there's anything hugely different. If it's more selective, of... so in theory it will have less interactions than Fingolomod. Yeah. You could use a Fingolomod as your starting point. Yeah. Yeah. So basically cardiac drugs, you need to be cautious. Things that prolong QET interval, things that um, you know, beta blockers, anything that slows the heart rate, you need to be cautious, um, not necessarily contraindicated, or they're likely to be. Um, and things that are metabolized through that same liver enzyme pathway. And the one that always springs to mind with me is fluconazole as a is a drug that um, would increase your siponimod and fingolimod levels um, potentially if they were taken together. But that's like I say, I would anyone who's worrying about siponimod, I would just think fingolimod. Yeah. But the only the only difference being instead of coming in for the first dose initiation, you've got to have this swab and then a titration pack. So you start on a low dose and go up slowly. So we don't have first dose ECG monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of that, you've got this. Um, swab and initiation pack and actually i read because i saw the question i thought i better just check if I, there isn't anything i don't know um i didn't know that you only have to stop the drug for four days and you need reinitiation with the initiation yeah. pack which is a bit annoying yeah so it's, <laughs> at least been gone and you've got two weeks to sort out the problem before you have to worry about re, re dose initiation but four days is quite that's a weekend yeah and then, in, in the times of covid and if we do get to phase two or phase three and if there's interruptions in supply, that it might cause issues. So um, we do need to factor that in. So you will want patients to have some sort of being aware of the compliance issues. And if they're going away, take it with them. Yeah. So, um, yes. And there's a question about our favourite topic, blue tech forms. Oh, is there? <laughs> Someone asked, um, Natalizumab, does it need, need more than one blue tech form, like ongoing? And so the answer to that question is all medication, if it's ongoing, needs the initiation form when you start the medication and then continuation forms on a yearly basis. Yeah. Yeah. And the continuation forms officially, because like you say, block contracts and, and COVID, um, they're, they're less they're less worried about us doing them on time and there's a bit of a relaxation but my advice is just keep doing them like you always do because yeah. otherwise you're going to have a backlog of stuff to do afterwards yeah carry on the system otherwise on the 1st of july when block contract that currently as where we stand ends. Oh, is it july i thought it was october oh, it might be october I, I, oh, no. I think it's being extended so we just okay. need to be careful that you do have a process that works because i don't i think sitting there and doing all of the blue tech forms for the last couple would not be fun so I suppose if you've started someone, I suppose the question might be relating to is if you started someone on natalizumab in, with the COVID exemption yeah. on the form, you just keep continuing that form. You wouldn't need to do another form once COVID's over, would you? Because yeah. they're on it then. Yeah, yeah. they're on it. And the same form, they just added another box to. So yeah, it's not so you just do a continuation form. form. Yeah. And in theory, if someone starts a treatment and comes off during COVID times, in theory, you don't need a form. But then you, do, you have missing data. So if you ever go back to this, data in years to come you'll have a group of patients that aren't there and it's just worth having it complete yeah because i'm hoping at some point we won't remember that covid is 2020 but i'm sure we're <laughs> never going to get this <laughs> <laughs> so there was also another question about um vzv i don't know if that was relating specifically to siponimod or no, I think it's vaccines in general i think it was ocrelizumab that it was relating to Okay, so I don't know about in your centre, but in our centre, uh, well, it, it's part of the SPC requirements for a lot of drugs, fingolimod um, yeah. and siponimod specifically it is, um, but most, a lot of the drugs uh, require full um, VZV um, immunity before you start treatment. Um, and I think some um, talk about a clinical confirmation of previous VZV, but we actually do an IgG, VZV IgG blood test um, on all of our patients and but we do that on all patients for all drugs as yeah. part of a, a part of a wider screening program so we test for uh, we do full blood count livers uh, liver enzymes renal function um, and then we do hep b um, core and surface antibody antigens hep c hiv vzv igg and a tb alice spot regardless of the tb risk of the drug we do and, and and the hepatitis risk and the vzv risk we do that for all patients and we've actually recently added in informally added in measles but we it's not formally gone into our yes. guideline yet because there's still some discussion about that but i know some centers do you do routine, routinely do measles yeah. yeah oxford do as well um so yes um it, and the question i've got here is is it necessary 
uh, for patients with low titers of IgG against VZV to be vaccinated. So the definition of low there is in our unit is 150. I can't remember the um, units, but um, <laughs> uh, essentially if you're immunosuppressed and you have a titer of less than 150, the advice is to vaccinate. And it's a live vaccination, so you need to therefore not be on treatment in order to receive it. Um, so that's why we do it at baseline. So that and we catch anyone who's not had a VZV immunity before we start anything. Yeah, because yeah. you've got a six twelve week delay. It's, a, it's two it's two injections, isn't it? Six yeah. weeks apart, and then you've got to wait six weeks. So it's a twelve week delay to treatment, um, which is significant for a newly diagnosed person waiting to go on for anyone, but specifically for a newly diagnosed person. But yeah, so we do all that at baseline. So hopefully, people then moving on to other treatments later on, it's not a question for us. Yeah. It's, it's a difficult one. And also with the new COVID vaccines, none of us know what they're going to be. I think it's thought they're unlikely to be live, but I mean, to be honest, we don't know. There are 20 different versions of COVID-19. So, you know, what it will end up covering, we don't know. Yeah. Um, we don't know. So this is why I think it's important to treat patients and not delay waiting for vaccine because we don't know when it's coming. No, we don't. What's yeah. coming? No. <laughs> Yeah, and I think just coming back briefly to the VZV 150 unit thing, it's important to remember if that measurement is taken while they're on treatment or not on treatment, because you may get a lower IgG reading simply because they've already been on something else. So if yeah, you've got a good history of chickenpox, clinical history of chickenpox, then you need to bear that in mind as well. But yeah, but like I said before, we're re reconsenting or adding the conversation in the notes rather than a formal consent about COVID-19 vaccination with our patients. Yeah. just so that we don't want people you know if a vaccine does become available in six months time to and say, oh, I, want, I wanted that vaccine but nobody told me i was going to have a less of a response to it because yeah. of the treatment that i'm on it's hard it's a very hypothetical question because we don't know when it's coming what it's coming so yeah it's very difficult yeah so one of the questions that we had before is from a patient and it's should a a patient who's been diagnosed with MS about five years ago, currently on plegridy with no benefit, commenced ocrelizumab in December last year, so December 2019, due the second dose in June of this year, so now, would, at your centre, would they go ahead? So yes, would be the answer. So as we've, as we've described, the ABN guidance is, um, is reasonable to, to, to redose ocrelizumab in a times of a high infection rate. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind as long as that can be done I think they make the statement as long as that can be done in a safe yeah or uh, safe as possible environment in terms of COVID risk so yeah. yeah so we would have a conversation with them about um, what their risks are their personal risks are and explain that the guidance and that we would be able to offer them the infusion if they wanted to go ahead yeah I think what's interesting there is that is the fact that it's only their six month first six month dose yeah. and in my experience I'm more comfortable with delaying doses the longer they've been on it. Yeah. So the B cell suppression, yeah, the B cell suppression happens immediately, but uh, and is sustained in my experience for more than six months. The patients yeah. that I see coming back, um, we at our centre routinely do B cell measurements on everyone, even though you don't need to in the SPC. Yeah. We're doing it from a research point of view. So um, uh, all of them are low. I didn't say all. Of them. I did look at it the other day. Not all of them. There is a very small group of patients who had a high B cell, higher than normal B cell count to start with. So their B cell counts aren't as low as you expect. But when you look at the reduction overall, it's They're still all getting a reduction. It just depends on how you different place. Yeah. yeah, but um, but there are some. There's a couple that are maybe non-responders in that respect. If you look at, you always get you know the bell-shaped curve, don't you, yeah. with the people at either end who are extreme. But I've had patients. So patients who've been on it. The longer they've been on it, the longer it's taking B cells to come back is my personal yeah. experience. And that, um, and that was found with rituximab in all the rituximab studies. It was, you know, there, there's a, the, it, the effect goes on a bit. So actually you, it would be easy to delay a year two, year three, year four patients. Exactly, yeah. So one. this particular patient, I would say, yes, have your dose if you're comfortable with that and if your personal risk is, 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 is okay. Um, and then subsequent doses, maybe 12, 18, the 18 month and onward doses, if we were still a pandemic yeah. or you were worried about infection, would be would be more reasonable to delay those going forward. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's definitely you have to individual, individualise it, but also look, I mean, we don't know what centre this patient goes to, but also look at what that centre 
is offering and capacity as well because it, it is all very different everywhere yeah, yeah so we've got five minutes left so if you want to type any questions into the uh, q a box don't forget to do that and so the questions about vaccinations is very topical but there was actually the query about that before covid um because vaccines were always something that because of immunosuppression the use of live vaccines everyone was always querying and it would be the most common question to a medicine information neuropharmacist about what, what we're doing with the vaccines and can we use this when we're on this therapy um it's it's, it's not yeah. vaccines obviously travel vaccines are less of an issue right now we can go nowhere but yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah and i do think there's a gap in the market there for some guidance um, you know, uh, national guidance to help people. And I think there is enough, I think there probably wasn't enough information out there for a long time about it, but people are starting to pull together. I've seen a couple of presentations now where people have pulled together what is out there and it's quite, a lot of it's quite reassuring. I mean, there's two things here. There's, there's the risk of vaccination in someone with MS yeah. in terms of triggering, you know, you, you know there, is, there, were, there was a school, is a school of thought that, that having vaccinations might have caused some people's OMS or that having a vaccination might cause a relapse. And I think we can say, based on the evidence that I've yeah. seen, that that's not the case in either that's of those right. scenarios, that, that, that vaccines haven't been shown to cause MS or, or an MS relapse. Although obviously maybe P patients who, in whom that personally has been an issue, the broader evidence doesn't suggest that's a problem. And then, as you say, there's the whole issue of when, when to vaccinate in relation to treatment and what the risks are for that patient depending on what treatment they're on yeah um, and i suppose it goes the same as the flip side of the covid thing isn't it in terms of the more riskier the drug in terms of covid infection it's this it's the more risky they are in terms of live vaccines particularly yeah. because of the complete immunosuppression you get with alimtuzumab and cladribine those are the ones you're not going to be giving live vaccines to after they've started and I think that's the issue. It's just you do have to look at each drug, which is why the way if you do all baseline tests to start with, work out what vaccine you need to get or might potentially need, have it all on day one, meaning that hopefully later on you will keep some of your immunity, whatever yeah. treatment you go on to. Yeah. And I think what's been one of the really interesting things to come out of this, you talk about how a pharmacy, the role of pharmacists has just occurred to me while I'm talking to you actually is actually it's not just the network of neuropharmacists what I've really valued from this experience is re-networking with my specialist pharmacist colleagues in other specialities at my trust so one of our specialist pharmacists very quickly set up a one of the many teams calls that we're all having to do virtual calls that we're now having to do but with our specialist pharmacist network we had face-to-face -face meetings yeah. always but they were always cross-site you know not always you know, people had to travel not everyone was always there but to get all of the specialist pharmacists on a screen <laughs> initially twice a week actually while we were trying to manage some of the issues particularly around biologic therapies and that cuts across more than neurology you know that's gastro dermatology rheumatology um the specialist medicine um have got a I think some of the oncology it's you know some of their mm. learning has been so a lot of the oncology regimens have, have turned into subcut regimens, like off license, but to move away from having fusions. Now that's not something that we've really done in MS. Like I know some of the therapies are looking at going forward at being able to give subcut, but actually is that something that if this pandemic had been bigger, that we could, you know, we could have considered and learn from our oncology colleagues. I know that, yeah. And there is a conversation about the new therapy that's coming to market in the next few months um, is a subcut B cell therapy and whether that's the way to go in terms of not having to come into hospital um, yeah. and you know, a, a shorter duration of action in terms that into well that's debatable I mean it's given every month rather than every yeah. six months but the effect on the B cells is still going to be prolonged isn't it the more you have yeah. it so I'm not quite sure how that works maybe they will come up quicker I don't know the answer to that but I think the caution there particularly for any non-pharmacists listening is that um, there's a big pharmacy resource required in delivering drugs through home care. So if yeah. you're thinking that's going to be the answer, a subcut monoclonal antibody delivered at home, you need to really think through how your service can actually cope with that if they're, if they're well set up to do that at home care. And I think for the um, like the legislation and the licensing of that therapy, um, it has been delayed. FDA have said they're delaying the amount. So, you know. Oh, like, yes. It, yeah. It, we don't know why, though, do we? <laughs> No, it's not, I mean, that might, could be because of COVID workload. So it, yeah. it might, you know, so it just, if you're thinking it's coming next week, it's not. So <laughs> <laughs> next year. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, we're coming towards the end um, now, so it's quarter past one. So I want to thank Rachel and um, Neuro Academy.